Welcome to Zen Vesting Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Templeton. Let's start exploring. Let me go ahead and welcome you to the Zen Vesting Podcast with Lauren Templeton, exploring the world of investing. And today I have as my guest, Guy Spear. Guy is the CEO of Aqua Marine Capital Management, which he launched in 1995. He's an investment manager. He's the author of the book, The Education of a Value Investor, which was published in 2014 and has sold many copies and been translated into various languages. And Guy, you have a new podcast with the same name. I've listened to a few episodes, The Education of a Value Investor. Can you tell me what led you to start your new podcast? I'll be delighted to, after I say thank you, Lauren, for inviting me onto your podcast and to tell the audience that I, I feel so privileged. I remember that I met you for the first time. I believe it might have been at the Wesco meeting or it might have been at a conference just after the Wesco meeting in um, Pasadena. And since then, uh, we've had a few conversations, and it's just a privilege to come on your show. So thank you, Lauren. And I feel like by talking to you, maybe I'm also talking to um, uh, our, one of our heroes, uh, a member of your family. And so somehow I feel like I'm entering into a tradition, and it's a real privilege. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I remember meeting you at that conference. You have a great memory. It was right after the Wesco meeting. And I think we had traded some emails and you were in the courtyard with Monish Pabrai. And my husband and I were up in the hotel room and we had received an email from either you or Monish that we should come down to meet you. And we were so excited (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to come meet both you and Monish. It was, uh, you know, we were giddy um, that we were well, getting to meet you both. So I I remember that moment very well. Well, it, that was before I'd published my book. So I, I feel it was an e- extra generous thing of you to do because I was just some no-name person running after, uh, in that case, Charlie Munger. But so the, the podcast... Um, I'm, you know, so one of the things that I, I discovered through the social media is this concept of learning in public. And I figured out that I had to uh, start learning in public. In a certain way, writing a book is learning in public, but you kind of work really hard on it and produce a finished product. Whereas what I realized through all these different media, you can learn in public and produce by producing things that aren't necessarily ready for primetime consumption. So it, I was nervous to do it. And one of the things that in, encouraged me actually was, and I wish I remember, it's it's actually a heavy metal band. And one of the members talked about how they would do jamming sessions where you had to have the courage to suck. And I, I had to develop a certain amount of courage to suck at podcasting, if you like, because I knew that I would start and it wouldn't be particularly good. And what I would also say is that at the time that I kind of decided to do it, which was kind of a lockdown project for me, I was stuck at I was stuck at home, not able to go anywhere, not able to meet anyone. And I thought uh, that this would be a good way to learn. But by that time, there were already some very well established podcasts in many different areas. But what I figured out was that I do what I'd done with my writing, which was it's never good to sit down and say, I'm going to write a bestseller. But it is good to say, I'm going to write down and figure out what I think about a particular topic. Uh, And so what I wanted to use the podcast really for was to kind of use it as a platform to talk to people and to talk to them in a way that I might not normally talk to them. So this, by the way, is a great case in point. It, It would be hard for me to contrive a reason why I should talk to Lauren on the other side of the planet. But here we get to spend some quality time together. So that that was the basis for the podcast. And my goal is not to become some well, very well-known radio show with, with millions of viewers. I'm just happy for every conversation that I have on my own podcast. 
I agree with you, Guy. So I look at this podcast as an excuse to talk to really smart people around the world and visit with them and share those conversations with anyone that would like to join. So I see it the same way. And I've learned a lot from just three episodes that I have recorded. Um, But really excited to have you on today and to be a new listener of your podcast, The Education of a Value Investor. I listened to the episode with your wife, Lori, yesterday and um, another episode this morning as I drove to the studio. So they were both really good and I enjoyed the episode with your wife. That was fun. Thank you. And I, I'm delighted you listened to that. And so I'll tell for you, you probably already know it, but and maybe many of the audience don't, but for your interest, this it's it's relatively new to me is that, and I guess it's an idea that somebody called David Perel taught me, which is that we are all um, feed for an algorithm, the algorithms being run by, by Google and other online um, social media providers. And we're kind of... Um, We're being fed into those. Our attention is being fed into those. But when we produce content, we actually turn the game around and we get to use the algorithm for ourselves. And so um, what excites me is that I I was so happy to have that podcast with my wife, Laurie, out there. And it's so exciting for me that Lauren has found it and listened to it. It's not like I had to push it into your lap, Lauren. You found it on your own and decided to listen to it. And my, my most exciting point, Lauren, if, you, if you're not aware of it, is really quite amazing is that, as I understand it, if, if you type a search term into the Apple podcast ecosystem, then every single word on every single podcast has been, uh, is, is searchable. So, for example, I just talk about heavy metal musician. If you would, if, if once this goes up, if you were to search heavy metal musician, then that it could bring up our conversation. And so the idea that you're putting yourself out there and allowing the algorithm to put you in front of people who might be interested in hearing what you have to say is something that's very exciting for me. Uh, the idea that Laurie might be getting connected up to all sorts of people based on the content of her po- podcast is exciting as well. So, but thank you for listening. I hope, and, and actually just one last thing before I hand the mic back over to you, Lauren, is that, if and when, I mean, I don't think you've met Laurie in person, but if and when you do, the conversation is going to start from a completely different place because you have this knowledge about Laurie that you wouldn't have otherwise had. Oh, so it, it's a warm start. It will. I already feel like I know so much about her, her views on education and uh, Montessori school and all of that. So I look forward to meeting her one day. Let me give um, the listeners just a little bit of background on you. So you were born in South Africa. Your nationality is German. Um, You went to, you attended Oxford University. You received your MBA from Harvard. You now live in Zurich, Switzerland. So you're very global. Your family is very global. Can you give me or give the listeners an idea of what the global perspective has added to your investment philosophy and exactly how does a value investor end up in Zurich, Switzerland, one of the most expensive cities in the world? (laughs) Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, I, I am global and I've spent a certain amount of time quite proud of that. I should tell you that, um, when, when Laurie, my wife and I met Warren Buffett for this charity lunch, I had placed some of these those details about my life that you just read out to the listener into Warren Buffett's assistant's hands so that she could show him. And, I was, and I'd also written a little bit about my wife, Laurie, who was born in Salisbury, North Carolina, and grew up in Mexico. And I thought that Warren would be interested to see that global background. And instead, he went straight for Laurie, my wife, who... Uh, with whom, so he has a friend who was born in and grew up in Salisbury, North Carolina. And so he wasn't particularly interested in my global side. And I think that the way I've involved, interesting enough as an investor, is that I find myself increasingly attracted to and grateful that the majority of my investments are in the United States 
kind of far away from global turmoil. And I think that I have successfully invested globally, but I think in all sorts of ways, I have uh, dodged disaster by the skin of my teeth, and I'll be happy to go into some examples because what we tend to do when we go from a home market, and for me, I would, even though I live in Switzerland, I would, I would talk about the United States as being my quote, home market. And then we go to some country around the world, you know, developing frontier. And I, what I will do and what I think all investors do is we project a whole bunch of assumptions into that market and assume that the market is the same as the one we come from is our home market. And, and actually those things are not true. And I think that the perils of investing in frontier and developing markets, let alone simply developed markets outside of the United States, are far greater than we realize. And if you come at a time, perhaps it started in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when American capital was going overseas and the rest of the world was developing and becoming more like the American system, it's a particularly benign environment to be investing far afield. But uh, from the perspective of today, where you know, we hope that freedom and the West will win in this, this conflagration in Ukraine, but we can't guarantee it. And perhaps we're going to go through a period where the Western style of capitalism, the, the freedoms that we have, will be rolled back a little bit. And it will not be a particularly benign environment to be far away from these kind of home markets like North America. Just briefly, and I, we can dive in greater depth on that. I think it's a really interesting topic. Uh, how does a value investor find himself in Zurich? You know, uh, first of all, it is one of the world's most expensive cities, but I would never conflate uh, value investing with inexpensive. Uh, my father has an expression. That he says, I can't afford to buy cheap, if you like. And I think that, um, so for me, where you choose to live, if you can afford to live there, sort of what you pay for things is not the primary concern. And what I would say in Zurich is that it is an expensive place to live, but it's an extraordinarily efficient place to live. You get enormous value for the money that you pay to live there in terms of simply quality of life. And that quality of life goes to the fact that your taxes and my taxes in Switzerland pay for things like excellent roads, bridges, parks, clean rivers, places for my children to go and play in playgrounds, a thousand different quality of life issue uh, factors. But then I, have, I, I strongly believe that I am more efficient and the people that I work with are more efficient in Switzerland. And the reason for that is, is that everything's so easy. So getting around, getting on the tram or getting onto a train to get into the center of town is very, very straightforward. When somebody commits to doing something, you don't need to have a, a contract with 30 pages. People actually do what they say they're going to do. And there's very serious consequences if they don't. They kind of get squeezed out of society. So um, you can live in a, I actually, I think I wrote about in my book, you live in a country where business goes at the speed of trust, which makes things so easy. And so, yes, it's an expensive place. But in terms of value for money, I think it's more than more than made up for by all these other things that you're getting. And, you know, as we as investors, we want to be paying for something less than we get in return. And many things, as we know, as investors appear on the face of it to be expensive. But when you know what you're getting, they're actually not that expensive at all. I would say that about Zurich. It appears to be expensive, but it's actually it's just absolutely extraordinary place. Very, I feel very grateful to be a part of. Very important um, points and analogous to investing in any asset. I was just teasing, you know, John Templeton lived in Lyford Key in the Bahamas, which is not an inexpensive community. Um, but he organized his life in a very efficient way and felt that his investment returns um Actually, he calculated it, that his investment returns um, increased after he moved to the Bahamas because I think, well, he always said he got the Wall Street Journal a few days later than everyone else, which was an important part of that. But I think he just had a really clear mind and uh, he lived in a beautiful place. He exercised every day and it afforded him the ability to think independently. 
So. Yeah, and and I've actually, when I was in the Bahamas, I had to find my way to Life and Key in order to see where he lived. And I, I have to confess that I, I know that Life and Key worked for him, and it is a very a place where you can refine your life a lot. Um, what I find for myself, and I, and you know, I have a, a number of good friends who seem to want to all move to Austin, Texas. Mm-hmm. And but I I like for me that would have been too far away because I actually like some kind of city life. I like the fact that there are cinemas and theaters nearby and that there are students and there are street cafes and there's an art scene. So I do like all of that. And I think if I was in the US, uh, I, I would I would look for maybe somewhere like Santa Fe or I, I believe you're in Chattanooga. Yes. So you've kind of found, and it's there, there's, there's stuff that's been written recently about how um, smaller towns which have a certain agglomeration of services but are not on a huge scale are actually the, some of the, in today's world, are some of the best places to be. We, um, re- we really enjoy living in Chattanooga. And when I first launched um, my hedge fund in 2001 with Seed Capital from my uncle, I went to visit him and I was so excited. And I said, so where do you want me to move? Should I move to New York? Should I move to London? And he looked at me and he said, Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> and um, I think he wanted me in a city that um, didn't have a lot of competition and that had a high quality of life. I mean, he's from Tennessee. Um, he grew up in Winchester, Tennessee. I chose Chattanooga, which is really close to Nashville, but I had gone to boarding school here and already had some contacts here. And actually, the city had a good deal of in- investors and in alternative investments at the time even more so than Atlanta, because Julian Robertson's uh, first partner was from Chattanooga, and a lot of the original capital in in Tiger was Chattanooga Capital. So a lot of those investors um, still are invested in in the Tiger Cubs. I mean, we see portfolios here in Chattanooga that you wouldn't believe you see this lineup of managers and you're like, how in the world are you invested with these managers? You're just, you know, a small little foundation in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And it all goes back to that initial relationship with Julian and his college roommate. So I wanted to um, bring this back around before we started recording, we were talking about attending the Berkshire Hathaway AGM, which is coming up very soon, about a month away. And I wanted to tell my listeners that in 2017, 2007, you made headlines by bidding $650,100 with Monish Pabrai for a charity lunch with Warren Buffett. You have referenced that lunch on this podcast. Can you tell me the dividends that have accrued to you from your lunch with Warren Buffett and how that has impacted your life? Yeah, I mean, what I can certainly tell you is that the best dividends are not measurable. And so a bit like when you find the right person to be married to or um, when you have children, it's it's you, it's hard to measure them in dollar terms. But um, there is there is so much that I took away from, from that launch that in a certain way it continues to instruct me. And, uh, you know, and why is that? Because we can all go to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting and we can all watch videos of Warren online. And at the end of the day, I don't think there's much that Warren said to me and Monish at that launch that Warren hasn't said in one way or another in a public setting for anyone to hear. But there's something that happens when two people or in this... And, and it's it was me and Warren when I was asking him a question, he was responding to me. There's a kind of a a presence and an immediacy to the lessons that are, are driven in that that don't that don't work as well as if you're um, just in a uh, in a in a hall with a lot of other people or if you're watching online. And for example, the the first I, example of that that comes to my mind is well, it, it, and now that I start to think about it more, come to my mind. But um, you know, at the end of the launch, if you read some of the biographies. They claim that Warren was kind of, in a certain way, stingy with his family. But when when he when he tipped the waiters and he was made sure that he tipped the waiters, 
he tipped them very significant amounts of money. I mean, they, they were clearly hundred dollar bills in his wallet, and he was handing out wads of them. And that that was that struck me as very different to what I'd read about him, which was that he he that in in he was you know watching pennies and and careful to lend pennies out, and so that was in stark contrast to what had been written about it. And that's kind of percolated through in my mind in in a thousand different ways to make me feel obliged to be more generous around people. And I actually have a goal, for example, in any hotel I stay in, there's some, there's a book that Monish introduced me to called Heads and Beds. And, you know, I'd never known that a good way to tip room staff is to, is to put some money under the pillow that when you put the money under the pillow that says, this is for you room staff. This is not just money that I left on the counter that is mine. This is for you. And I particularly like doing that because the room, you know, you, you often might tip a, the porter or somebody like that, but you, you the, the room staff don't necessarily get that. But to live your life in in a kind of an in a cloud of generosity uh, where people feel grateful that you're around and that you're alive was some a lesson that I learned. Simply, it's not just that I observed that. I put that together with other things that Warren has done. I mean, actually, just today... Warren sent a letter to Monish Pabrai. I just tweeted it out on social media with Monish's permission, telling Monish that um, uh, the the Dakshana Foundation is uh, a giant amongst foundations and is achieving extraordinary things. And it's like a four or five line letter that is, again, does Warren have to do it? Does he get any personal benefit from it? No, it's just something that he does and you know, so so if I look at that little factoid about you know about the Dakshana Foundation, and then I look at his tipping of the waiters at the, the the lunch, you see that a pattern emerges. And I have other places to triangulate from. So I guess being at the lunch made it far more possible for me to triangulate things that anybody who knows Warren or even who doesn't know Warren, when I say these things, they say yes, that's true or that rings true. But it, it, it helped me to learn the lessons more profoundly. And I'll just give you one other example of that before I uh, hand the mic back to you, Lauren, was that I had to be with him in his presence to see how in th- he almost fell over himself to please us. And at some point early on, he said, he said something along the lines of, well, you guys have spent a lot of money for this lunch, and I'm going to damn well make sure that you get your money's worth. And, and you know, it's kind of like I practically jumped out of my skin, Lauren, because, it, it, you know, you, you kind of would expect somebody who's in a, a service provider role of some kind where their job is to make you happy. They're the maitre d' at a restaurant. They're the, you know, they're the head of guest services at a hotel. They're some kind of client-oriented person. You almost expect them to do that. But here's Warren Buffett, who's one of perhaps the wealthiest or one of the wealthiest guys on the planet, runs one of the most successful corporations on the planet, has press and other people clamoring to come after him. And then on account of some charitable donation that you've made, he's falling over himself to please me. That showed a level of humility and control over his ego that really set a very, very high bar for me. And I think that that you know, and again, I think that what I'm I'm trying to tell you aspects of the lunch. I mean, there was certainly wisdom that was shared, and we can go into it if you like. But it's these kind of this implicit wisdom and implicit learning that comes from just learning from the situation itself. I think that having witnessed Warren be that way, it's far more easy for me to be humble. You know, there's a, so I, I I did a very very short conversation that I recorded and again put out. Uh, yesterday with with a guy called Nithin Kandkar who writes research reports not far from Mumbai and he sends them to me and 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 he just appeared in my email inbox and he was he was so shocked I said well let's just do a short recording here you and me and he said he kind of described me as some big guy and him as some small guy and I kind of said no we you know I'm we're both seeking the same thing we're both seeking investment wisdom and enlightenment and I think that I was more able to do that because I'd seen Warren do that with me. And by contrast, I know of somebody who, or I know the story of somebody who had, who won a charity launch with, um, I mean, I know that it's happened with Tim Cook at Apple. 
and it's happened with I think it's now the former CEO of Google who's whose name escapes me, although I can picture him very, very well, Eric Schmidt, where they kind of, they say that the person wins the charity launch, but then it's like sort of 45 minutes with the person in the canteen. Mm -hmm. And in Warren's case, you know, three and a half hours into the launch, we were still there. He was not going to cut us short on time. He made sure that we had a long extended conversation. Again, because... So, so all of those, that's amongst the many, many things I've learned. So how does one count the dividends from that? It's made me a different person in the world, actually. So, and I could go, that's just one tiny aspect. And we'll see where you go in the questions, but I could dive even further if you'd like. Well, I love your response to that. I have one Warren Buffett anecdote and about maybe 20 years ago, or maybe it was 15 years ago, I had asked my father what he wanted for his birthday. And like all dads, he said, don't spend any of your money on me. And so I was thinking, what was a really creative gift I could give my father? And he is a huge Warren Buffett fan. So I sent Warren Buffett a letter. And I asked Warren Buffett to call my father and wish him a happy birthday. And Guy, I even forgot that I sent the letter to Warren Buffett. I didn't expect that he would receive it, much less respond. I mean, he's a very busy man. His time is very valuable. And I was out of the office on my father's birthday, and I was reading my emails on my phone, and I received an email from Warren Buffett's assistant that said, Warren Buffett tried to call your dad to wish him happy birthday, your father didn't answer the phone, but he'll try back in a few hours. And so Warren Buffett did, and he wished my father a happy birthday, and they spent five to ten minutes chatting. Um, and Warren Buffett asked Dad about himself and in a very humble, genuine way. And I sent Warren um, a message after the call and said, I appreciate that so much. I didn't actually think you would do it. I would like to make a contribution to the charity of your choice. Please let me know your your charity, and I'll send the money as a, um, a token of appreciation. And he responded to that and said, uh, please don't do that. It would cheapen what I did. Your dad is a perfectly delightful person. I enjoyed the conversation. And I thought, wow, you know, this has got to be one of the busiest guys in the world, and his time is worth so much, very valuable. And he actually did this. It was the sweetest thing, I thought. And, and I think that what, what you, so when I put all of these different things together, I think that, and it's something that I, I, I'm getting better at. And there's this extraordinary joy that comes from doing something for somebody where there's no way they can ever express their true gratitude uh, for what you've done. And the obvious example would be when you're a parent to a child. I mean, you know, the enormous, extraordinary effort and commitment that it takes to bring a child into the world and then bring them up is is something that humans do all over the planet. But it's a sense of, of giving where you don't ever expect anything back from the person that you're giving. And not only do you not expect anything back, then there's not really a way that you can thank somebody from giving you life. And what an and analogous to that, I think that Warren's identified these ways in which you do so things for people that there's kind of no way they can thank Warren for it. And that kind of deepens friendship and love and appreciation. I'll tell you the story that I know that kind of is, is analogous kind of story in which, as I understand it, it was one, and, and I really have to look this up and get the proper details. So for the listener, if I've gotten the details wrong, please forgive me. And even better, get in touch with me and tell me the correct details. But I remember being in New York sometime around 1996-7. And uh, I think it was Forbes or it might have been another one of those business publications came out with a strange double cover. Uh, and one of the photographs on the cover was Warren Buffett. And the other photograph on the cover was the CEO of one of the Chicago-based banks where Berkshire had an investment at the time. And as I understand the story, uh, the business magazine had approached Warren and said, 
we'd like to put you on the cover of our magazine. And Warren had said something along the lines of, no, I'd rather you put the CEO of this bank that I'm invested in on the cover. And eventually they reached a compromise and did this strange to sort of double cover. But I think of how I would have felt as the CEO of this bank when my largest perhaps and most powerful shareholder, what he goes and does is he ensures is that I'm on the cover of one of the, the kind of like um, large, most distributed, most recognized known business magazines in the country. And again, the, you know, what Warren did was burnish the CEO's reputation in the way, in a way that the CEO could never have done for himself. And in a certain way, when you've done that for somebody, there's no price that you can put on it and no way in a certain way that you can say thank you. And what I sense about what I believe I see in Warren is that he's, he's, he's addicted to doing it. He loves doing it. But it, it's also an extraordinarily smart thing to do because, I mean, look how much time we're taking talking about it. Just So it, it enhances your reputation while at the same time, and that's, well, put it the other way around. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to do for humanity. It makes the world a happier place, deepens your friendship with the person, appreciates somebody, and is good for business and good for, you, for reputations all around. And so I, I've learned with Warren that he often does things. When he does things, there's multiple layers on which you can analyze it. There's multiple prisms or lenses or angles that you can look at it. And what happens is that it makes sense from every single angle. And I think that actually it's an interesting decision-making heuristic to say, you know, how many ways does this make sense? And if you can see three or four ways in which it makes sense, it's a no-brainer to do it. But if you only see one way that it makes sense, then maybe it's not a no-brainer to do it and you might decide not to do it. And so your story about this birthday wishes, just to bring, bring this little airplane of a thought back down to a landing spot, is for me very analogous to this other story. And I think that there are many, many other stories like that. Uh, and again, I still, I'll go to bed sometimes and sort of decide to meditate on how I can bring more of that kind of behavior into my life because it's just so powerful. Yes. You know, I'm not a uh, Rotarian any longer, but what you just said <laughs> reminds me of the four-way test with Rotary, which I think is such a great test. And I don't remember all the four steps, but I believe it's, you know, does it, is it honest? Does it build, build goodwill and friendships? Is it fair to everybody involved? Um, it's just a great little test and a way to think about life. And I do think if everything you do is self-serving, it only serves you and you can't find any other aspects that are beneficial to others, it's probably not a great decision um, that you're making. Let me switch our conversation um, to a question that I frequently get. So I am often approached by young people getting started in finance, and they tell me they want to become an investment banker. This is very common. In your book, The Education of, Val of a Value Investor, you describe very well your own dis disillusionment with that side of the industry and your subsequent metamorphosis into a value investor. If I were a young, impressionable 20-something, and I naively told you that I wanted to become a banker, how would you summarize your personal experience and help me understand the intangible enrichment that comes from a focus on finding and or creating value, particularly on behalf of others. Yeah, and um, before we uh, engage in a in a festival of bashing bankers, <laughs> let's not forget that there are some highly highly ethical and good bankers. And I, you know, I think of actually on a flight from Omaha to Chicago at the end of one of the Berkshire Hathaway meetings. I found myself sitting next to somebody who it turns out works very closely. She works at Byron Trott and Associates. Mm -hmm. And her name was Mary Ann Todd. She was an absolutely delightful person. She's uh, a lawyer by training and works at Byron, Byron Trott, is well known as having been a success, having successfully yes. banked deals for Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. And um, he's the so only investment banker that Warren Buffett has ever come out and um, I guess not recommended, but um, talked about publicly is my understanding. Yeah. 
And and just to dive into that for a second, I, I love the question, Lauren, that he asked Warren, uh, because it's kind of like for any of those who fail to follow uh, what I think is a better path and end up becoming investment bankers, it's such a beautiful question. So apparently what he says to Warren when he meets him is, Warren, you know, we, you probably have a lot of problems that have been solved by other people. And I, Warren, I don't want you to think of any of those but perhaps you can come up with a problem that has not yet been solved by anybody else. And I would like to try my hand at solving that one. And the reason why that's such a wonderful, again, it's kind of like when you talk about multiple layers of uh, good reasons for doing something, you're, you're signaling so much in that simple question. First of all, you're signaling you're not after anybody else's business. You're not looking to displace any of the existing service providers. And, and, and then you're also saying, I only want to end up getting paid for you for, by you for doing something if it genuinely solves you a problem. I don't want to be here trying to convince you to buy rat's poison and have you pay me a commission for buying rat's poison or whatever else. So, so that's just to say that not all investment bankers are bad people, if you like. But I think that um, what I would want to do, and it, look, I wanted to go into investment banking simply because I'd figured out that I was interested in finance. Uh, I'd figured out that uh, this is sort of like what I, the way I described it when I was a recent business school graduate is I kind of said, you know, finance is where savings meets investment. And that's a very, very interesting place to be. And the people who control or who manage the process by which savings meets investment are kind of like in a very interesting world with the capacity to add a lot of value and to make a lot of money. And that is all absolutely true and so i think that a young person who wants to get an investment banking has seen that and then if you don't have a deep understanding of the industry you would naturally gravitate towards that and maybe only learn later i think that the place that i would want to go and mike sorry lauren my computer's just gone the screen's just gone off can you hear me i can hear you oh that's good i th- i was afraid that you might not be able to hear me you don't have to cut that out. I think that these podcasts work great when people realize that it's a real live conversation. Authentic. So, yeah. I think that, um, and I need to, if I move my mouse, I was just afraid that somehow my computer was shutting down. I think that, so first of all, the, my point to the student is that is a very, very natural thought. Uh, and I, I actually think that it might be hard to convince them otherwise because maybe it's just a road that you have to go down and learn by yourself. But where I'd try and go is to say, look, one of the big lessons that I've learned from Warren is to be very wary of people who are trying to take a cut because they made a market or because they introduced two people to each other. And some of the most successful people found a way to remove that friction. And actually, what an investment banker does is that they they kind of live in that place of friction. And there are many cases where one can actually get rid of that friction and it's not really necessary anymore and the investment banker is obsolete. But even in the places where the investment banker is not obsolete, it's not a pleasant place to be because your whole rationale is to take cuts off one side or the other side or both sides. And But I think that I, I find myself slightly stumped because I think that it's something that is so clear and obvious to those of us who've been around the block a little bit, but it's not exactly easy to share those insights with somebody who hasn't actually worked in it. I don't think, I remember sitting at my investment banking desk on, I think it was 40 Wall Street, and reading Buffett's annual reports, and I, I remember feeling this tremendous sense of envy because I realized that Warren was just telling the truth about what he was doing. And I realized that what I had to do was was maybe not lie, but but I certainly was ex- it's not that I was expected to be deceptive, but only that if I wasn't deceptive, then I wouldn't get any deals through. And mm-hmm. uh, in much ways, would I have to be deceptive? I'd in order to bring the deal in, I'd have to convince the people who had the deal that they were going to get uh, the best opportunity through my particular team. And in you know what I was unable to say to them is, look, my job is to lure you in and then to sufficiently tie you in to our team 
And at that point, the deal, there's somebody else in the team who's going to do their very, very best to, to turn the screws on you to get the maximum out of the op- maximum gain to us, your investment bank, out of the opportunity. Mm-hmm. That's what I would have said if I wanted to be utterly honest. And of course, there was no way that I could do that because otherwise I wouldn't bring the deal in. And it's not like the investment bankers or the people I'm working for are telling me to do that. It's just that I'm not going to bring anything in successfully and to just take it on to the other side. Uh, you know, my job in selling these things to investors was to to sort of like sail that narrow line between being sufficiently truthful with the investors that I could meet all of the, the legal disclosure requirements so that nobody could say we hadn't disclosed what we were required to disclose, but at the same time to keep hidden from view or to not have particularly prominent all the reasons why one should not do this. Mm -hmm. And that is just a horrible, horrible place to be. And I I don't think I was being paid to lie, but I was being paid to be economical economical with certain aspects of reality. And so that's just a natural thing when you set yourself up uh, as being on the other side of the table to somebody. And there are just better ways to be. But I have to say that all the way until I actually worked in that environment, Anybody, you know, Lauren Templeton, Guy Spear telling me that this was not a good place to go and work at, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have convinced me. So I'm kind of skeptical. I think that may be something that people have to go through on their own. I and so I would say, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was about to say, I think so too. And just to personalize um, this a bit, uh, last summer, um, one of my very best friends contacted me and asked if I would give her son an internship. And we do not provide internships any longer. I have found that they're very distracting to have in the summer, um, in your office over the summer. And I need to focus on my own studies and, and studying the market. But this is one particular friend that I could not say no to. Her family has been so kind to me. So her son came to intern with us. And You know, I had really low expectations. It probably was not very fair. But he turned out to be the hardest working kid, the smartest kid. He's so competitive. And he's doing really well in college. And he has an investment banking internship this summer. And he's so set on investment banking. And he's almost, he's very competitive that I I watch him and I'm afraid he's just going to burn out. And I was talking to his mom last night and I said, you know, he's really got the world by a string. If he can just keep the string from strangling himself, I'm afraid that investment banking isn't going to be everything that he thinks it is and that he's going to get really burned out and he's going to leave the industry by the time he's 30 And she was telling me that um, she and her husband have the same fear. And then I talked her into making him go to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting with me in May. Because I said, what I hope for him is that he'll find an employer that takes a great interest in developing him, not only as an investor, but as a human. And um, I'm not sure that that's the investment banking route But I'd like for him to come to the shareholders meeting and just meet all the wonderful, nice people in Omaha that we get to visit with every year at the AGM. So I'll have him with me in May. And it'll be interesting to follow his career. I agree. He has his mind so set on investment banking. There's this is a road he's on himself. Like there's no changing his mind. But it'll be interesting to see. Um what he takes away from his investment banking internship and if he wants to continue it. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not very, i my children are now teenagers and I, my wife and I discover every day how unprepared we are for having teenagers and probably having adult children. But one of the things that we're learning at great pain to ourselves is that we just have to let go and allow our children to experience the world and, and, you know, I find myself wanting to just sort of like drum a lesson home, and it's so hard to realize that I'm trying to I'm trying to share these pearls of wisdom that have been acquired through 
you know, long experience and lots of pain and lots of mistakes, and I want my children to be able to avoid them. And they just hear me droning on. <laughs> they just don't hear me. But I think that, you know, you taking him to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting without setting any expectations is really a wonderful thing to do. And you can bring a horse to water. You can't make it drink. But you are bringing the horse to water. And I, I would make a broader point, and, and it's something that has come home to me in a thousand different ways, that, you know, so, so in terms of who we are as people, who we are as families and as communities, we, we cannot ever rest on our laurels and sit still. We're either improving or we're getting worse. And if we're exerting the effort to raise ourselves in terms of our moral standards, in te- terms of our business practices, then we're improving. But if we try and rest on our laurels, then we are not improving, we're going backwards. And, and so I actually treat the visit to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting as, as a kind of an act of self-improvement. And many of my office staff will be there at my expense, and I'm so happy that they're there. But this conversation makes me realize that I've actually made a mistake in not casting that net of people that I encourage and actually perhaps even pay f- to bring to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting wider because that will ultimately improve the business environment in which I'm operating in. And so you know, I think you're doing a great thing by bringing him. And um, you know, maybe we should both be thinking about bringing more people. And you never know when that lesson, a bit like for me with Warren, there are things that I see today that when I connect them up to the lunch, a penny drops and I get just a little bit better. You will never know when um, this intern of yours, through the experiences that he gets at the Berkshire meeting, but connected up with something else he experiences somewhere else, the penny drops for him and he nudges himself in a slightly better direction. I agree. And I, I hope that he really enjoys the experience. The phrase, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, was my dad's favorite thing to say to me when I was growing up. <laughs> so very yeah, and, familiar with that one. And we both realized that, that it was probably said more out of frustration than anything else because it's reminding himself that he can do so much. I think so. His children and grandchildren, but not much more, you know? Yes, I think so. I was a challenging uh, teenager. And now that I have a 13-year-old daughter, he looks at me and he says payback is hell <laughs> so <laughs> i think uh, he... I have to tell you, daughters and mothers teenage daughters and mothers are not a you know really tough it's tough really, really my tough. oldest really sweet kid so i liked i really lucked out there um and i enjoy her a lot but she does have a little you know teenage um grumpiness to her i will say let me uh, switch really quickly because we've already been recording now for about 50 minutes to some investment questions. Yeah. Being located in, in Zurich, you are geographically closer to the horrors and f- unfolding in Ukraine. And like the rest of us watching, it's impossible to not be saddened or upset by these events. Yet at the same time, as an investor, with an eye towards value, you are also regionally proximate to a wide spectrum of share prices that have fallen the most during the past several weeks. Do you find it difficult to disengage from the human tragedy and focus your attention on the potential opportunities being created in the markets? I I would tell you that I do find it difficult to disengage from the human tragedy and I don't know if it would be any different if I was, it might be very different if I was sitting in Omaha, for example. I always think of Rose mm-hmm. Blumkin, who immigrated to the United States. And as I understand it, the only place she wanted to get to was a place that was as far away as possible from the place from which she came. And I really feel quite ashamed as somebody who identifies as European that we now have war again on European soil and somehow, for me, this is different to the um, what happened in the former Yugoslavia, because that, I think, could be, in my mind, I kind of put it down to a kind of a civil war, whereas for me, this is what is going on in Ukraine is not a civil war. It's one country invading another country. And I find myself extraordinarily grateful, Lauren, because so I, I've, I've been trying to think through what, what is ethical investing? And I know that investing in 
I, I don't buy this. I, I think it's a Milton Friedman idea that you just have to look to see that the business is operating in a legal fashion. And once you've seen that the business is operating legally, we as, as investors don't have to think any further. I think that that is not the right way to approach things. And so I've, I've seen friends of mine talk with big wide eyes about investing in, for example, one of Russia's leading banks, the JP Morgan of Russia. And my decision not to dig and dig further into that was simply that I, I said to myself, I don't want to invest in a country that imprisons journalists and its leading politicians, which is something that Russia has been doing for a while. And maybe once in every 50 years, a country that does that plunges itself into a massive war and gets sanctions on it. But it's just not good karma to mm-hmm. be invested in those kinds of places. And then when it when it comes to looking at prices that have been beaten down, I think that I actually find myself extraordinarily grateful that the majority of my investments are in businesses that are nowhere in the region and uh, are only very, very marginally impacted by the region. I think that there's a good real estate analogy that I'd like to share with you in that I think that a mistake that I made in personally investing in a weekend home when I lived in New York was that I mistook, I I found this, my wife and I found this lovely old country house far away from, far away, an hour's drive away from New York City. And our perception was that this was a bargain because uh, in terms of the real estate that we were getting, in terms of pure space, it was it was a lot relative to what you could get in the city, but it was somewhere that was it was an old house that was was an hour's drive away. And by contrast, so so what do you get in real estate? Is that the prime assets, the the, the beautiful apartments with views at the tops of centrally located buildings with good infrastructure, their prices don't go down a lot in the in a crisis, and they continue to rise quite strongly in a strong real estate market, whereas the prices of the price of real estate located, for example, this this beaten this old country home with needing a lot of work, or um, apartments in tower blocks which are lower down the tower block without views and maybe not in the centre of town, those prices drop very rapidly whenever there's a there's a bad real estate market, and so you kind of perce- you you have to be. Your timing has to be really, really good. You have to buy when people are really depressed. And then you have to sell quickly because the prices of these non-central, non-prime assets rise for very short periods of time before they go down into the doldrums. I think that one can make a similar kind of analogy with the capitalist world. You have at the very core of American Anglo-Saxon-style capitalism, you have the great American corporations and you have businesses that are kind of based in the world's highly stable democracies. So it's not just the United States, although that's the center of it. You could also call Canada, Australia, probably parts of Western Europe. And then if you go further afield from that, it's a bit like my old country home. You have, you know, the, the, your timing has to be really, really good. And, uh, you know, inevitably one time or another, something happens that beats those things down a lot. So I do not some combination of my extreme distress at the politics of it, which is awful, but also this awareness that I really want to own the prime assets on the planet. I, I want my fund to own the prime assets of the planet. And and those prime assets are very unlikely to be located, for example, in Ukraine or in countries nearby that are affected. Just to give you one case in point, I had a lot of fun reading up and learning a little bit about a company in Ukraine called Motor Sich. And Motor Sich is like Boeing or Airbus of the former um, Soviet Union. They were suppliers, for example, of the Antonov um, air transport, sort of equivalent to Hercules C-130 to Russia, and they made um, engines. And like about 20,000 highly, highly skilled, knowledgeable engineers, a real aerospace leader, but and, and and you could buy those shares, Lauren, for like one time's earnings until they were taken over, nationalized by the Ukrainian government for like one and a half times earnings, certainly not mm-hmm. compensating the shareholders for the risk. By contrast, and, and there's, there's a friend of mine, and 
called Milo Jones, who lives in Poland, originally American, kind of says that his view is that the, the, the philosophy of value investing developed at a particular time and a particular era and geographical zone. So it, it developed after the Great Depression and happened in the United States. And it's not that you can't apply those precepts in other geographies, but you have to apply them with with great wariness about projecting into these new geographies and history, historical periods truths that are no longer true. They were true for when this philosophy was developed, but are no longer true today. And mm-hmm. um, and so, you know, long story short, and, and to bring this home, um, I care a lot about the crisis, and I actually don't see it as a kind of a, a, an opportunity for me. I, in, in a certain way, perhaps a summary of what I'm saying, Lauren, is that is that I'm not feeling particularly bullish about prices that have been beaten down as a result of this crisis. I see. Um, there are some great companies in Europe, though, that really um, have fallen in price. I'm thinking things like Unilever, Unilever and Nestle. Um, so you're not adding to names in Europe or initiating new positions? You know, um, in, in my case, I'm fully invested. So in order to move in order to add, I would have to sell something. And I've learned that that's not a, a particularly great thing to do. I think that, you know, if I, I mean, you happen to mention two companies, one of which I own shares in. I, The fund has been a long-time investor in Nestle and a very happy investor in Nestle. And actually, interestingly enough, the CEO now, not that I'm friends with him or have any contact with him, is a, is a classmate from business school, which makes me very proud. Mark mm-hmm. Schneider, he's doing a wonderful job. Um, you know, I, I think that in, in the case of both Nestle and Unilever, there is a discussion as to whether they ought to leave Russia. And there is a very good case to be made that they should not leave Russia because they're actually providing basic foods to the general population. And it would be a, it, it would be a kind of um, retribution to people who are not responsible for what's going on. But I think that they've made themselves extraordinarily unpopular with um, those of us in the West who are very angry about what's happened and who feel like every single country should leave, no questions asked. But, I, you know, so, so I, the way I see it, uh, Nestle is a global company that happens to be headquartered in Switzerland in Nestle's case, but it's very much a part of the global capitalist system. I, don't, I wouldn't see Nestle as being any different to, as you mentioned, Unilever or some of its U.S. counterparts and so I certainly would invest in that. That, for me, is economic high ground, if you like. That happens to be located in Europe. Yeah. And, yeah, if it's, if it's, it's kind of uh, ir- irrationally beaten down because Nestle is almost as valuable, even if it never does any business, business in Russia ever again. Mm-hmm. During the past several years, Guy, we have remained bullish on India's long-term economic and investment-related future. And I understand you have a similar view on that. What attracts you to investing in India? And what is your favorite Indian investment idea today? Yeah, I mean, India for me is, is it's, it's when you see either companies or countries like India then it's it's it becomes a, a kind of more uh, about as close as you can get, I think, to a no-brainer decision. And I think that India is obviously an extraordinarily complex place. Uh, it's got I don't know how many languages, I, uh, different um, different states within in India. I mean, it's only recently that they brought in a, a unified general sales tax for all of India. So it's extraordinarily complex country with extraordinarily complex problems and huge difficulties that it will still needs to overcome in order to become, uh, to have same, same income per capita and standards of living that we have in Western Europe and in North America. But there's been a change in India that's occurred over the last 10 years where Indians as a nation understand and know and have the confidence that they're going to get there. And I have a feeling that the first time I inv- visited in India was in the early 2000s. And in many places, there was this sense that the problems were insurmountable. We'll never get over them. We're going to be caught in this stagnation, former British colony. You know, it's half of us wanting to become 
uh, members of the British Raj or the or the inheritors of the British Raj and the rest of us all being um, quote untouchables or at the very dregs of the bottom of society with no social movement at all. That was the country as it was. Today, just to give one example of the incredible changes that are happening in India, uh, India brought in a a law called RERA, Real Estate Regulatory Act, which is modeled on something that was developed in Dubai. It's not something that we have in the West, but it forces every property developer, when they develop a property for sale to um, individual property investors, they have to file a prospectus in the same way that a, a, a U.S. publicly listed company would file a prospectus. And that prospectus commits the developer to what they're going to do and makes it very easy if they fail to meet, meet those promises for the, um, for the property investor, the individual property investor, to get compensated. That's created an enormous amount of responsibility within the Indian property sector that was lacking before. And, and there is enormous amounts of capital flowing into very, very needed um, infrastructure or, or, in this case, real estate development in India as a result of a simple regulatory change that the country made happen. And so there's this sense in India now that, yes, we face problems, but we know how to overcome these problems and we know how to break through the log jams that have existed in the past because we had a socialist outlook, because we had a cumbersome legal system, we had uh, this, uh, we had democratic norms that were very, very difficult to cut through. And, and so uh, the country is on a path to somewhere. And then when one asks where the, what path the country is on to, I feel like there's no doubt in my mind that it's going to be a rambunctious, complicated, imperfect, but an open society and a democracy, a capitalist democracy that allows people to own property and allows people to earn a return on their investments. And so a very benign environment for people like you and me to search for investments and invest in. And uh, I actually, what I wrote in my annual report, Lauren, is that I find myself being far more wary about investing in smaller countries. So a country like Ukraine, I mean, I pray every day that Ukraine isn't snuffed out by Russia, but I'm in no doubt that Russia wouldn't mind snuffing it out and making the country and its leaders into satraps of Russia, whereas India, with its enormous size, is is just too big for any. There's going to be no Russia that says it wants wants to swallow India. So India's um, politics and India's legal system will survive in you know whatever that is thrown at the world in the next hundred years. That system will survive, and that sort of creates a kind of a certainty for me. Having said that, Lauren, I I've I read in probably Times of India or similar Economic Times publication that as many as 50% of publicly traded Indian companies may well be frauds. That's a very, very high proportion, which means that in spite of all the positive things I've said, it's still an extremely treacherous place to invest and, and you might end up having your head handed to you if you invested with the wrong people. Yes, so. that, that is a good warning to investors. I think an important one. Um, so lastly, Guy, I would, I just wanted to say that I think that one of the most important attributes we look for as a basis for future success is having a growth mindset. And my uncle, Sir John Templeton, created a very carefully chosen motto for his foundation, the Templeton Foundation, which is how little we know, how eager to learn. And it's not hard to see that you also have a growth mindset and a pursuit of lifelong learning. I think it's really exciting. You're very energetic. Where can my audience go to follow you um, going forward and learn from your wisdom? Well, Lauren, that, I, I, as I read through the questions, that was, I just if, it was so lovely to read that. And uh, I felt so um, flattered. And I think that um, if it, if people see, I mean, I, yes, isn't isn't you know, it's almost like, well, we'll get to the second part of your question, but um, you know, people talk about indoctrination in negative terms. They say, oh, you shouldn't indoctrinate people, and 
we see Russians. A, a friend of mine talked about the zombified, a whole generation of Russian zombies who've been indoctrinated just to believe certain things about Ukraine and the West. But I kind of see a positive side to indoctrination, which is that you know, we want to indoctrinate ourselves to positive behaviors and attitudes. And I think that I, I, I would like to indoctrinate myself every day to be a better learner, if you like, and to have a, to have a more of a growth mindset. I have somebody in my office who took an English exam. She needed to get a certain level of English. I can't remember why. And she failed it. And she was so disappointed and so upset and so angry. And, and I kind of, you know, my response to her was, you know, what I want you to do, what I wanted her to do is to go and, and plan to, to try and um, fail that exam five times over just for the sake of getting used to the idea of failure because it's not the failure that counts. It's what you do right after the failure. Do you get up and uh, keep walking? Or as Winston Churchill said, when you find yourself when you find yourself in hell, the, probably the best thing to do is to just keep walking. Or he had something else which he said. Uh, his his job was to stumble from failure to failure without any loss of enthusiasm. And <laughs> That's so, a good one. Yeah, and I think that, you know, growth mindset is not just an on or an off switch. One can train oneself to have a growth mindset and to be more growthy, if you like. And I'll give you one simple, very simple example um, I used to train with somebody who's an American guy based in Zurich as well. I'm not the only guy who's moved to Zurich from the U.S. Um, Jeff Grant, he's a, he, he, I don't think he coaches anybody anymore, but he took me out running and it started to rain and he saw me kind of become slightly demotivated because he wants to go out running in the cold rain. And he said, he said that what he wanted me to train doing was there's a kind of like a key key sort of few milliseconds of when the rain starts raining and our body has the reaction of saying this sucks it's raining and he said what he wanted me to do was to get in before that natural reaction with a with a self-conscious statements to say yes rain yes thank you for the rain thank you for the adversity i'm going to use this adversity and he said it's kind of a timing issue where you have to really kind of convince your mind and your body to have a different reaction to the adversity that comes up. And I think that that's an extraordinarily empowering idea. And I think that something to share with you and with the audience is it's not like, you know, maybe some people are born with more growth mindset than others, but we can all train it in ourselves and we have to train it in the smallest things, whether it's picking ourselves up quickly after we fall off a horse or if we if if we fail in an exam, or we go out running and and we um you know we get faced with rain or some other adversity, and and that is a muscle that we can train and 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 you know training ourselves to welcome adversity, training ourselves to not accept failure, but to use the failure, use the pain of failure to move on to 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 more learning, uh, is. Um, something that I appreciate your question because that reinforces something in me. And I actually look for ways to indoctrinate myself more in that direction. And actually one way to do it, and again, this is a Warren Buffett lesson, funnily enough, is that so anybody in the audience who wants to help me to develop more of a growth mindset, who wants to help my learning, you're, yes, extremely welcome to get in touch with me. And uh, probably the best way, most social media, my handle is G Spear, so it's the initial of my first name with my last name as G and then S P I E R, no dots or anything. That's also, by the way, my Gmail address. And uh, so you're you're also welcome to email me. And then obviously if you just type my name into Google, I appear in well various places. Lauren, I don't know how you treat social media, but for me I'm a social media slot. I connect to pretty much everyone. Provided you're not a Russian bot, I'm aggressive on blocking and defriending Russian bots. I'm also aggressive on blocking and defriending anybody who puts negative sentiment and uh, anything that is kind of not looking to make the world better, but provided you're looking to work, make the world a better place, I'll happily connect to you. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I know my audience will enjoy connecting with you. And it really has been such a pleasure to have you on today. There were so many Um, little bits of wisdom through our conversation that I hope my audience will value 
and carry with them going forward. So thank you again, Guy. Yeah, and thank, thank you, Lauren. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for an extraordinary set of questions. I would just tell the audience that what I've learned about podcasts is they take preparation as the host, and Lauren did come prepared. And the quality of the conversation is very related to the preparation and, and, and the quality of the host, and you've been a wonderful host. Thank you so much, Lauren. Oh, and I look forward to seeing you in Omaha. Yes, yes. We'll, okay. we'll make sure that we connect. All right. See you there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lauren. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Zinvesting Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions or comments, please visit our website at zinvestingpodcast.com. Happy investing and stay zen. As you know, investing is inherently risky. You can lose a lot of money. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security or invest in any particular sector, industry, or country. Do your own homework and be careful out there.